Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, thanks to uh, you, Alina and uh, Philip for asking me to speak in this uh, wonderful seminar that you guys have organized. It's much appreciated. So what I'd like to talk about uh, today is actually, oops, how do I advance to the next? Uh, strange. It, it worked before. It worked before. There we go. Whoa, we've gone to 51. Okay, let's see if we can. There we go. We're back now. Ah, wonderful. Okay, so um, what I want to speak about today is joint work with Stanley Shaw. Stanley is now at the University of Toronto, although he is on the job, job market this year. Uh, and uh, let's set the stage here. So we'll take F always to be a binary form with integer coefficients. Assume the discriminant is non-zero, so we have something non-trivial. And the degree is at least two, and we'll call it D. Okay. So what I want to look at is the, the set of integers uh, which are represented by the form. So given any positive number z, we'll let the set of, of non-zero integers of absolute value at most z, for which we can find integers x and y such that fxy equals that integer, we'll denote that by script r f of z. And then the cardinality of that set uh, by uh, just capital R f of z. Okay, so if we think about the, the simplest case, where, question? No? The, the simplest case is when F is a binary quadratic form. And in that case, in fact, that's, this goes back to the, the giants of the, uh, Early days of number theory, Fermat, Lagrange, uh, Legendre, and Gauss, they investigated various properties of the set script R, F, and Z. As for the growth of uh, capital R, F, and Z, when F is a binary quadratic form, uh, that's, a, that's a subtler question that uh, was first taken up by Landau. Landau looked at the, uh, the, the case of integers represented as the sum of two squares, so f, x, y, and x squared plus y squared. And what he proved is that there's a positive number c0 such that the counting function, the number of integers up to z, which uh, can be written as the sum of two squares, is asymptotic to c0, z, divided by the square root of the logarithm of z. Uh, it's, it's striking, I think, that Lando's result was proved in 1908, and of course that's already 12 years after the proof of the prime number theorem. Uh, now, in uh, Michel Balschmidt's lecture earlier in this uh, seminar series, yeah, he mentioned that uh, uh, that extend that, that Bernays was a student of Landau, and Bernays four years later in 1912 in his thesis extended Landau's result on f x y equals x squared plus y squared to uh, any irreducible um, positive definite quadratic form, and then of course you have to change. C0, C0 to another number that depends on the form you're, you're looking at. Anyway, so, so not uh, what Landau is showing is that, um, that uh, we don't get uh, all the integers up to z, we just get a very thin set that are represented. And uh, how about this number C0? Well, C0 is. Uh, known as the Landau-Ramanujan constant, and it's given 
on the screen here. So one half of that infinite product over primes congruent to three mod four, and we take the square root of the whole thing. Uh, how is, uh, how is Ramanujan's name associated with this? Uh, well, in fact, when Ramanujan wrote to Hardy back in 1912 and, uh, uh, 1913, and he, uh, he sent Hardy that, this incredible long letter with 120 amazing claims, uh, some extraordinary integrals and uh, continued fraction expansions. One of the things he mentioned was that the, uh, the, the function rf of z when f was x squared plus y squared, he said was asymptotic to 0.764 dot, 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 uh, essentially z over root log z. Well, he didn't phrase it like that, but that was the, the content of his message. And uh, uh, later, in fact, he, uh, he specified that the 0.764 corresponded to this uh, infinite product representation of C0. And of course, he, he didn't supply a proof and as is typical, uh, his intuition brought him to, uh, to the correct uh, order of magnitude for the counting function and in fact with the correct constant. So even though this was, he certainly was not aware of Landau's earlier work, but uh, we'll give him credit for his astonishing uh, insight here. Okay, but I really don't wanna speak about binary uh, quadratic forms, I'd like to go to forms of higher degree, that's the content of this lecture, and uh, let me just take you through a bit of the, the history. The first result of uh, substance is due to Erdős and Mahler in 1938, and their result was that, well, they proved that if, if f is irreducible over the rationals, and d is at least three, then the function rf of z uh, grows at least as fast as a constant times z to the two over d. So of course, uh, this is a different, uh, a different situation because if you take d equals two for binary quadratic forms, you'd, just, you'd have growth like a constant times z, and we know that's not the case. Uh, so here's something else is happening. Um, when you see that result, well, the first thing you can ask, uh, the most natural thing to ask is, can one in fact uh, get an asymptotic result here? What is the true order of magnitude? And in order to, in order to state such a result, and figure out what the truth should be, we have to introduce the following region in the plane. That's the, the set of real numbers x, y, for which the absolute value of f, x, y is at most one. Uh, this is uh, the fundamental region of f in the plane. And uh, it's, uh, it's a region that generally isn't convex and in fact isn't even compact because if, for instance, fx1 has a real root, then you're going to have uh, you're going to have cusps going off to infinity, uh, which are close to the line given by x equals alpha y, where alpha is a real root of f, and so you're going to have all these spikes corresponding to the real roots. Uh, nevertheless, the the area is well defined of this this region of the fundamental region. And uh, we call that, we're gonna designate that as A of F. Okay. And so it wasn't until 1967 that Hooley was able to give the first asymptotic estimates for a class of uh, binary forms of degree at least three. And he did it in the, in the special case that f is irreducible, 
a binary cubic form. And in addition, he required that his binary cubic form had a discriminant, which isn't the square, not the square of an integer, in other words. And uh, what he proved is that result that I've stated there. So RF of Z is the area of the fundamental region multiplied by Z to the two thirds. So that's a two over D. Uh, D in this case is three. And you can see he just squeaked it out. He, uh, his error term is uh, smaller than Z to the two over three by this log log power of Z. Nevertheless, that was a huge step forward. This is the first uh, asymptotic estimate for, uh, for the counting function uh, for a large class of uh, binary forms. He, he finished the irreducible cubic case in 2000. So he was able to treat the case when the discriminant is a perfect square, perfect square of an integer. And uh, in order to state his result, this was a, this was a subtler business. Um, we have to introduce a bit of notation. So suppose that fxy looks like that, b3x cubed plus etc. Associated to fxy is the Hessian covariant of f, and that's a quadratic polynomial with coefficients capital A, capital B, and capital C, uh, where those coefficients are given in terms of the uh, initial data of f, so the coefficients of f in that manner. So that's the Hessian. And now what Huli did is he put n equal to the square root of the discriminant of f, remember that is an integer because we've assumed delta f is a square, uh, divided by the GCD of the coefficients of the Hessian. And what he proved is that if f is an irreducible cubic, uh, he also assumed b1 and b2 are divisible by three, delta f is a square, then in fact, this counting function for the number of integers of absolute value at most z represented by f is asymptotic to the area of f times z to the two thirds with a further weighting factor. And the weighting factor is one minus two over three times n, that integer m which we've defined above. Okay, so, so clearly something different is happening in the irreducible uh, cubic binary form case when the discriminant is a square. We, we don't get the area of f times z to the two thirds, we get it weighted by this rational factor. Okay, well, he was also able to deal with quadratic forms that had a particular shape. So we looked at quadratic forms that were as, as indicated here. So ax to the fourth plus 2bx squared y squared plus cy to the fourth. So that's a very particular shape. And uh, he was able to prove quite a satisfactory result here. Uh, it depended upon whether the quotient little a over little c was a fourth power or not, fourth power of a rational number. If it's not the fourth power, then the counting function grows like the area times z to the half divided by four with an error term. Now here we're winning uh, quite a bit on one over two. This is 18 over 37, not 18 over 36. So we actually win a positive power here. But if A over C is the fourth power of a rational, we write that as capital A to the fourth over capital C to the fourth, where A and C are co-prime, uh, positive integers, then the counting function grows like the area times Z to the half divided by four, times again we have this weighting factor. Uh, in this case, it's one minus one over twice capital AC. Okay, so when you see this pattern, we're getting the area times Z to the two over D times some rational number. 
So he was also, Hooley was also able to treat uh, the case when f is a product of linear forms with integer coefficients. And a number of people looked at the, uh, the very natural, uh, interesting case of uh, forms that looked like x to the d plus y to the d. So that's Browning, Graves, Heath Brown, Hooley, Skinner, Woolley. And uh, they obtained asymptotic estimates for the, the county function. And then uh, Mike, uh, Mike Bennett, Neil Dummigan, and Trevor Woolley uh, looked at a slightly more general binomial uh, form AX to the D plus BY to the D with A and B non-zero integers. Okay, so that's a quick tour of, um, uh, of results where asymptotic estimates for the counting function had been obtained. And this brings me now to our result with Stanley, which uh, we have here. So the usual assumptions, F's a binary form with integer coefficients, non-zero discriminant, and degree at least three. Epsilon's uh, some positive real number. Then we can find a positive number CF, depends on F, such that in fact the counting function is CF z to the two over d plus an error term, uh, big O of uh, basically z to the uh, beta f plus a little bit plus epsilon. And this is only interesting if, of course, beta f is less, strictly less than two over d. And so I'm going to tell you what beta f is now. Uh, basically, to determine beta f, uh, we examine how f uh, factors over the reals. So if f does have a linear factor over the reals, then beta f is defined according to this, this table here. Uh, I guess the thing to focus on is that generically, so in the case that d is at least nine, our error term, so let's see if I can go back, whoops. Our error term here is compared to two over d is essentially one over d minus one. Uh, but for smaller d, uh, we don't do quite as well. There's a different regime in place. Uh, in the case that d is equal to three and f is irreducible over q, instead of 12 over 18, we get 12 over 19 for beta f. Uh, we can do better yet if we know that f has exactly one linear factor over q and d is three, that's four over seven, and better still if it splits completely and then we get five over nine. Okay, so what about if it doesn't have a linear factor over the reals? Well, in that case, d has to be even, and uh, generically we're getting a one over d as our error term, that's at least for d at least 10. And for d equals four, six, or eight, we get three over d root d. Okay, well, what, what's the proof depend on? Uh, basically, uh, several things. We're, we're uh, making use of some absolutely beautiful work that uh, has gone before. Uh, in particular, um, we need some very nice uh, work of Salberger, who, uh, who refined uh, Heath Brown's piatic determinant method. And of course that in turn can be taken back to the determinant method of Bombieri and Pila. Uh, we also need an argument of Heath Brown to control integer points in the cusps and uh, a classical result of Mahler. Uh, in addition, when d is three, that's when we have this, uh, uh, we're able to do better if f is irreducible, is reducible, excuse me, 
Uh, then we're appealing to a result of Keith Brown on integer points on non-singular cubic forms, and also to work of Hooley and, uh, and Zhao. Cam? Okay, well, yes. There's yes. a question in the uh, chat room, Fabien Patsuki. Um, Fabien, okay. could you unmute and just ask away? Um, yes, so sorry for interrupting, Cam. I just want to know if you can say a word about CF. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. In, in fact, I will say rather quite a bit about CF, but I thought I would put that off until, until uh, close, closer to the end of the talk. But I sure. will say quite a bit about CF. Uh, in, in a sense, CF depends on the automorphism group of F and uh, and so we'll go into that in, in quite a bit of detail later. But, sure, thank uh, you. Okay, so, so again, let me just give you a, a, a suggestion on what, how the argument works. How about this result of Mahler? So the result of Mahler that, that we need is from 1933, so it's a classical result, and uh, it's again a counting function. So we look at the set of uh, pairs of integers x, y, for which the absolute value of f, x, y is at most z. And, uh, and I look at, whether it's zero or not, doesn't matter. And I look at the, the counting function associated to that set, n, f of z. So we're counting, uh, the number of integers for which, not, not the integers represented, but just the pairs of integers x, y, for which the absolute value of f, x, y is the most simple. Okay, so what's Mahler's result? So he says, well, if f is a binary form with integer coefficients, non-zero discriminant, degree at least three, then with af defined uh, as before, so that's the area of the fundamental region, associated to f, uh, the counting function grows like the area times z to the 2 over d with an error term of z to the 1 over d minus 1. Well, Mahler actually only proved this result under the assumption that f is irreducible, but his, his philosophy uh, works just fine to prove it in general. In fact, uh, uh, Mahler's result does follow as a special case of uh, some beautiful work of Jeff Thunder on uh, decomposable forms. Uh, but uh, let's, let's see what, uh, what's happening with Mahler. Okay, so uh, if you look at, uh, at the, the region defined by the inequality absolute value fxy less than or equal to z, then its size is uh, essentially AF times Z to the two over D, its area. And you'd like to think in terms of geometry of numbers where what you're doing is you're just uh, assuming that the number of integer points in the region corresponds to the area. And with this sort of uh, mental template, it's no surprise that you get this result. That's what you'd expect. The only thing, of course, is that your region is, as I've already mentioned, uh, non-compact. It's got all these cusps and potentially all sorts of integer points could hide in the cusps, could hide off in these spikes going off to infinity. Well, what Mahler used to uh, deal with that possibility and sort of the deep part of this result is he used the work of Tui Siegel. I mean, he didn't have Roth, but he had the precursor, Tui Siegel, uh, and uh, his advisor was Siegel, so he, uh, he, he, he was definitely aware of Siegel's work, and he used that in this context to control the number of integer points in the cusp, and in the balance of the, um, of the region, he was able to use geometry of numbers arguments to, uh, to get his result. Okay, so um, uh, another thing that, so let's just go, go back here again. 
if, if we see this result and we say, well, wait a second, if it's the case that for every pair x, y, uh, we're going to get f sends that pair x, y to a distinct integer, h, then in fact the counting function is just going to correspond to the number of points. So we would get uh, it immediately from Mahler's result, we would get the uh, result we want. Well, we've seen that it's not so far from the truth. Um, uh, we saw with Hooley's result that in fact that was essentially the case, that had to have been essentially the case. We know in general, of course, uh, a binary form of the Tui equation fxy equals h can have many solutions. And, uh, and so what one has to show is generally there are very few uh, solutions to the associated Tui equation. And so each pair x, y gives essentially a, uh, a new integer h, uh, which will be counted by the function r, f, z. Okay, but there are, there are definitely instances where that's not true, and that's why we introduced the notion of uh, an integer being essentially represented by the form, and we say it's essentially represented if it's represented, first of all, and whenever we've got two pairs of integers, x1, y1, x2, y2, that are sent to the same integer h, then there's a reason for it. And that reason comes from uh, an automorphism. Uh, so a GL2Q transformation that leaves the form uh, unchanged. Okay, we'll come back to this. Uh, but let me just finish off by remarking that if there's only one integer pair for which uh, fx1, y1 is equal to h, then h is certainly also essentially represented since the identity is in the automorphism group of f always. Okay, so that's this notion of essentially represented. So we've got Mahler's result, we've got this notion of essentially represented, and we'd like to show that generally uh, uh, things are essentially represented, so we want to control when they're not essentially represented. And for this, uh, that's where the work of Salberger comes in. What we do is we look at the, uh, the surface X given by uh, Fx1, X2 equals Fx3, X4 and P3. That surface is smooth since our assumption is that the discriminant of F is not zero. And what we do is we count integer points on x in a box which don't lie on a line on x by means of uh, a result of Salberger, the bigger the box, the worse our estimate, but we're gonna play off the size of the box against uh, how, uh, how far up we truncate the cusps in Mahler's uh, perspective. And that's going to give us our error term. And uh, so Salberger allows us to count points that on x in a box which aren't a line of x. And now by examining the lines, uh, we're basically able to uh, uh, count the associated integers h, which are not essentially represented and of absolute value at most z, and show that there aren't too many of them. Okay, but now we come down to these integers which are essentially represented and to figure out uh, how our count should go, we need to study the structure of lattices associated with the automorphism group of F and its subgroups. Okay, so I am going to return to that, but I would like to get uh, the, the, the topic of k-free integers represented by F also dealt with. So let me switch gears a little bit and now we're going to in some sense, go back to uh, uh, to our first theorem. So let k be an integer with k at least two, an integer is k-free, this is the standard definition, if it's not divisible by the kth power of a prime. And what I wanna do is I wanna introduce the, uh, first of all, the set RFK of Z, so that's the 
the set of k-free integers h uh, up to z in absolute value for which uh, there is a representation. So for which there uh, are integers x and y such that f x y is equal to that h. So here, instead of our f of z, that, that set that we looked at initially, we're imposing the further restriction that to be in that set, you have to be k-free. And we look at the, the counting function associated with that set. So that's capital R, F, K of Z. Okay, so, well, in fact, the first results on this, these counting functions, R, F, K of Z, so they would correspond to the result that I mentioned earlier of uh, Erdős and Mahler in the, in the case where one's not imposing this additional counting, uh, uh, this additional k-free condition. Uh, well, the first result that I'd like to mention here is due to Gouveia and Mazur. They proved it in 1991 and they uh, extended work of, of Hooli again. And what they looked at is just the square free case. So they assume that there's no, uh, no prime P such that P squared divides FAB for all pairs of integers AB. In other words, once, once uh, we're gonna count uh, square free uh, integers represented by F, but of course, if there's some universal square divisor of that, of all the values of f, that, that'll be an uninteresting count, that'll just be zero. Uh, so you impose that restriction. Uh, you also assume that all the irreducible factors of f over the rationals have degree at most three. This is imposed by sitting constraints. If epsilon is a positive real number, you can find positive numbers c1 and c2, which depend on epsilon and on f such that if z is big enough, then the number of square free integers represented by f up to z is at least a constant times z to the two over d minus epsilon. So you're, you know, you couldn't do better than two constant times z to the two over d. You're getting z essentially the right order of magnitude. Okay, well, Yaptop and I, uh, looked at this and we considered more generally um, the case of uh, k-free integers. So let k be an integer at least two. Again, assume that there's no uh, p to the k that divides f a b for all integer pairs a b. There's no universal k power divisor of all the values assumed by f. And uh, we made use of a lovely Sitting argument due to Graves and also the result of Erdős and Mahler to show that if k is at least r minus one over two, or in the uh, the case of square frees, if k is two and r is six, um, that uh, that we get r f k of z. The counting function is at least a constant times z to the two over d. Okay, so. These results, so both the uh, Gouveia and Mazur and uh, Yap and I uh, made use of these counts, these estimates for the counting function in order uh, to, to study twists, quadratic twists of uh, elliptic curves. So if you've got an elliptic curve defined over the rationals, you can ask uh, how many Twists of it have a uh, large rank where large is at least two. And in fact, uh, uh, both Gouveia and Mazur and Yaptop and I applied these results to uh, take advantage of certain constructions which showed that there were many such twists by uh, using these estimates. Okay. Uh, Stanley was able to extend the range uh, for which this result holds, for which 13 holds. Um, he did so by generalizing the determinant method of uh, Heath Brown and Sahlberger to the setting of weighted projective space. 
And as a consequence, he was able to, to sort of uh, widen the range over which these results hold. So essentially what you do is you, you strengthen the sieving side of the argument. And uh, he showed that if K is at least, well, essentially, seven times uh, r over 18, um, and kr is not 3, 8, and then the previous result holds. So this is pushing it up from r minus 1 over 2 to 7 r over 18. All right, but now um, we're able to get an asymptotic estimate for this counting function. Uh, by sort of building on the approach we use to, uh, to get an asymptotic estimate for our f of z. So here's our statement. So as always, f is a binary form, integer coefficients, non-zero discriminant, degree d at least three. r is the biggest degree of an irreducible factor of f of the rationals. If you want to just think of it as d, uh, that certainly works as well. Uh, we assume there's no universal p to the kth divisor, and we assume that our condition uh, 14 here on k and r holds. Then, in fact, the counting function grows like cfk z to the 2 over d. So we're not, uh, this is maybe not so surprising, we're not dropping down too much. The truth is that. Uh, you have some number CFK Z to the two over D plus an error term. Well, again, I better have that GKR of Z going off to infinity to make that a true error term. And here, here we don't win nearly as much. Essentially, we win a factor of uh, log Z. Uh, we have to be, a, it's a little more delicate in the case that uh, K and R are 2, 6, or 3, 8. We don't win quite as much uh, in those two cases, but uh, nevertheless, we do get the asymptotic estimate. Okay, so, so how, does this, how does this go? Well, it goes in a similar pattern. What we want to do is we want to, just as the previous result built on Mahler, we need something like that. So, we look at the set of uh, pairs of integers x, y, for which f, x, y is k-free and below a given bound. And uh, we define the, the counting function as just the cardinality of that set. And so we're, we're getting rid of, uh, of integers which aren't k-free, so we want to sieve out. And the, the natural thing to do here in this setting is to uh, sieve out in the following way. For, for each positive integer m, I want to define rho f of m as the set of pairs ij for which f ij is congruent to zero mod m, where ij is in zero to m minus one. And uh, we introduce lambda fk, which is this infinite product over primes uh, of one minus rho f p to the k over p to the two k. So this is going to take into account uh, divisibility by p to the k. The product converges, no issues there because our discriminant is not zero. And lambda f of k is exactly zero whenever we have some universal p to the k divisor. And we put little c f of k to be just lambda f k times the area. So we're doing the natural thing. We're weighting the area by this sieving factor. Here's our result with Stanley. So if f is a usual assumption, uh, we're going to require that r is the uh, largest degree of an irreducible factor of f over q. That's what the sieving sort of uh, lets us take. So as before, k is an integer where 14, so that's that condition on k and r. With that CF of K that we've defined, the counting function grows like CF of K times Z to the two over D plus a smaller order error term. So little CF of K is, uh, is just the area weighted by that sieving factor. 
And so what we're getting is uh, basically, this is not a generalization of Mahler, but it's an extension of Mahler to the case of k-free values assumed by a binary form. So let's see again, what we're doing is, uh, so Mahler is counting nf of z, and we're counting nf k of z, and we're introducing this weighting factor, which is the natural weighting factor coming from SID. Okay. Um, whoops, let's just see, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, let's just see, sorry, excuse me. Let's go forward, there's our weighting factor. Result that extends Mahler. And uh, let's recall uh, the first result. And uh, Fabian's question was about uh, C of F, capital C of F. Having seen the Mahler result, you'd expect that C, capital C F of K would be equal to just lambda F K, that weighting, that sieve weighting factor, multiplied by C F. Now, in general, that's not the case. Uh, and uh, I give a very simple example here. If gxy is 8x cubed plus y cubed, and k is either 2 or 3, then in fact, cg of k isn't lambda gk times cg, but 4 thirds of that. So what's happening here? So what's going on? Well, what we have to do is we have to go back Basically, what's going on is that this idea of um, being k-free doesn't play nicely with the automorphism group of the form f. Okay, so how does cf depend on f? Well, okay, so I've got to give you a tour here. So if we've got an element a in GL2q and f a of x, y is identically equal to f of a1x plus a2y comma a3x plus a4y, then we say that a fixes f. And the set of a which fix f uh, is the automorphism group of f, and we're going to denote it by odd f. Okay, well it turns out that there aren't too many options here for our automorphism group up to conjugation. So if two elements, two subgroups of GL2, uh, Q or conjugate, if we can find some element T in GL2Q such that G1 is conjugated to G2. Okay. So it turns out that the positive number, as we've seen in sort of the Hooli case, uh, Hooli's examples, is a rational multiple of the area. And the rational multiple depends on the automorphism. And there are, essentially it depends on the equivalence classes, uh, of automorphism groups, then there are, uh, there are 10 equivalence classes of finite subgroups of GL2Q under GL2Q conjugation to which the automorphism group uh, might belong. And let me just show you in this table. So they're just C1 up to C6. These are the generators. D1, the dihedral group up to D6. Those are the generators. Uh, and so that's it. That's the total number of possibilities. Well, I mentioned lattices associated with uh, these guys. So let me introduce the lattice of Z2 uh, lambda. So that's the set of all integer points UV in Z2 for which A of UV is in Z2 for all A in the automorphism group. That's a lattice. Let's let M be its determinant. M is, is one if the automorphism group is, is essentially trivial, so either C1 or C2. Things get complicated when uh, we have, say, D3, uh, D4, D6. If the automorphism group is conjugate to D3, it's got three subgroups of order two, with generators A1, A2, and A3, and one of uh, order three with generator Four. And I have to associate a sublattice with each of these guys. So let lambda i be uh, the sublattice consisting of um, the UVs for which AI UV is in Z2 
And uh, let's put mi equal to d lambda i for one, two, three, four. Well, we have to do a similar thing for d4. Uh, we look at subgroups of the automorphism group modulo plus minus the identity. Uh, we're going to define sublattices in a similar way and the determinants of those sublattices. We do it again for d6. Again, we've got uh, three subgroups of order two and one of order three. And we have to study how everything interacts with uh, these sublattices. So now uh, I can answer Fabian's question. And this is, uh, uh, this goes back to the very first theorem I mentioned, and that's this positive number CF in the statement of theorem one. So it's equal to WF times the area where WF is some rational weighting factor and it's given by the following table. Well, it doesn't quite fit in, but uh, here I'm giving you the representative of the conjugacy, cla or the, uh, conjugacy class on one side here. The weighting factor is given by these rational numbers. The MIs correspond to the uh, determinants of the lattices I've mentioned. Uh, let me just remark that in the case of D3, D4, and D6, the uh, integer m is the LCM of uh, mi, of the mi's, say m1, m2, m3, and m4 in the D3 case, and m1, m2, and m3 in the D4 case. Okay, so these are the weighting factors that we have to put in front. So I would just like to finish off very quickly by showing how Hooley's result from 67 fits into this framework. So if we've got a binary form uh, and we've got some element in our automorphism uh, group of F, that element acts on the roots of F by sending a root alpha to this expression. If it fixes a root, well, then it has to be a root of this quadratic, but if F is near to this, irreducible cubic, alpha has degree three, so those coefficients have to be zero. And that allows us very quickly to show that, ah, in that case, A has to be just the identity. If it doesn't fix a root, it's gonna permute the root cyclically and thus must have order three. And any element in the automorphism group of order two would fix a root of F, so, in that case, the automorphism group has to be GL2 conjugate to C3, the cyclic group of order three. So automorphism group of F looks like T, C3, T inverse with T and GL2 Q. And you can calculate, you can determine what forms with integer coefficients are invariant under C3. They have this special form with A and B integers. Okay, but uh, let's take the discriminant there. We can work it out. In that case, it's this square. So that tells us that, uh, that F um, is equal to G of T for some G invariant under C3. So in this case, the discriminant is the determinant to the six times the discriminant, which is a square. So in particular, is a square. So what we, what we conclude from this, that if F is an irreducible cubic, we need this irreducibility condition, and its discriminant is not a square, well then the only option is the automorphism group is just the identity, just C1. And we go back to our, uh, our table, we see in that case the weighting factor is one, and that's why we get, uh, and that's why Hooley's result follows with uh, the counting function like the area, times the weighting function of one, so the area times z to the two thirds. Okay, well, I haven't defined, I haven't told you how um, capital C F of K is defined in the square free case. That becomes, uh, that's a little more cumbersome. Um, that has to be defined to take into account both the weighting factor and the automorphism. So I'm just gonna leave that out and I'll finish by thanking.